electrical data, the ecology data that was collected, uh, was macroinvertebrates from both edge and riffles. So the edges form these slow flowing ponded water sections from here and further down here, and the riffle sections were setting um, uh, little area collection zones on that rock and everything off that rock being scraped into the net. So edge replicates, there was four of them at each site and same with riffles, four of them. And then diatoms were collected from midstream in the pooled sections. The bedrock also has lots of um, about head size rocks and they were no more than 30 centimetres below the surface. So they were collected and uh, one inch by one inch. And I think there was three of those taken off each rock, which led to nine diatom samples altogether for a site. And they were sent off for genus level identification. And the macroinvertebrates were also identified to genus level. Oops. So the data loggers, um, they had to be dynabolted to rocks on a star picket and then a plastic tube, whoops, under plastic tube um, piping, um, cable tied to the star picket so that during high rainfall events, the flow velocity weren't going to wash the data loggers away. So essentially a data logger is sitting inside that little plastic piping tubing, just looks like this. It's cable tied on a, on a length so it can sit naturally on the creek floor and it's tracking um, here. It's showing you the water level and this one down here is water temperature. I think you can see that's water temperature and this one here is level. So this shows a peak of rain and then the few days it takes for the creek to come back to a baseline level and then another rain event. So what I aimed to do was collect these four rain water level periods that the changing water level and I've graphed that for a mined and a non-mined site just to see if there were any differences. Now, the issue was during the period of study, um, often I would turn up and either a data logger would be missing or the whole piece of Dynabolt bracket, star picket would uh, be found on the bank or sometimes I didn't find them at all. So I was, I, I do know that there is no way a Dynabolt could have come out of the rock. That was securely placed. So. It was a difficult piece knowing the mining company may have needed to remove them to, to do some works at some point, um, but they weren't comfortable with my placing of them. Um, and they did contact me at one stage to ask me what I was doing. So I, I had to be mindful that at the end, I, I had rather gappy data and I didn't have enough to correlate well with an upstream and a downstream comparison on a mined and non-mined. So what I ended up doing was redeploying for two months on only one non-mined and one mined site and made sure they were in areas that were not going to be um, removed. And I was able to capture just for a couple of month period. So if you look at, I think this graph here shows that two month period from October to, oh, I'm struggling to read that myself, but this is the two month period that had four small rain events that I was able to track, the water loss after rainfall. And I was able to do that for a mined versus a non-mined site. So in terms of scientifically, it could be criticised because it sits a little bit outside the time period that all the diatom and macroinvertebrate and water quality data was collected. Uh, but it was an unfortunate series of events, but I didn't want to completely cut the data. So by getting this couple of months, what it shows is for each of those periods, so a 24 hours after rain, you have much steeper curves of a creek losing water to a level at a much at a lower rate than what it does in the non-mind. So these graphs, are my, I, I sh these ones, lines, these ones, I really should be putting curves on them. 
because they're actually rather, they're not linear. Um, but what it shows is these creeks are um, much less stable. They're probably gaining, that's, they've got a lot more water draining faster as a result of the additional cracks in the baseline than just these ones which would be flowing downstream. So I do plan on putting that in the publication. It possibly will get rejected because of the small amount of data, um, but it's worth me noting what the issue was just to open up um, further studies. And there has been some extra work done um, since I did this and published um, at the university. So in terms of what that looks like on the surface, you have, this is a non-mined um, aerial shot using near maps. Uh, that's O'Hare's and then this is Waratah Rivulet. So basically for that second rain event, this is about um, three days after that fairly high, I would call it a moderate rainfall event. You have a lovely um, connected stream, nice wide bank to bank creek coverage. And here you would have flow through that riffle. And if I zoomed in, I could actually show you the, the broken water over that riffle. This is non mined. When you come over to the mind for a fairly moderate, nice rainfall event, which had been occurring frequently, there weren't long periods of drought before this, you're suddenly finding, especially up here, big areas of the bank that are not connecting the ponds to the next pond. The riffles aren't flowing and you have more of them. Um, and they become quite frequent. So you, in, in terms of an ecologist's point of view, that, that's an impacted creek. So then starting to look at the data to see, well, what does that mean? Has it changed any of the fauna? Are any of the fauna stressed by these conditions? Um, so thanks, Nearmap. I've stolen that off their little time map. And I think, I've tried to go onto near maps recently to look at this, but um, uh, they seem to be taking less frequent photos above that particular part of the catchment. Which... So, water quality. We're getting to a little bit of scientific facts now, and there's a lot of numbers on here. I've presented this twice at the Australian Society of Limnology, and um, P is a statistical term of significance, and where P is less than 0.05. Um, it's proof that the statistical analysis chosen has found a significant difference between results. So if I just run you through. Um, here we go. So this is, first of all, we're starting with the physical water chemistry that is done in the field. The blue, I, I'm sorry for the actual small type in these graphs. Um, it's difficult to repeat or find all these different bits and pieces to tailor them for all the different talks. So I do, I will send a copy of this around to run, but um, it is fairly small typeface, but I'll talk you through it. The blue dots will always represent the non-mined sites and the green ones will always represent the mined. And I've been consistent through that throughout all these graphs. And I've separated the two seasonal events from the spring and the winter. You will tend to find um, fairly small differences. So remembering we're in a clean catchment, there's no other activity. You're not seeing the big differences you see from downstream of a agricultural area or a sewage treatment plant works. You're seeing small differences as a result of a change in the geological formation of these creeks. So, uh, big one to note is turbidity. Where you see the two blue reference streams have a very um, stable turbidity and their um, variance is quite small, meaning the more times you sample, how different are the results um, between sampling events, they're very close to each other. Once you're bringing in the mining activity, you're starting to see big variation. It jumps all over the place. The creeks are now not as stable as what they naturally were. And turbidity is a big one with the um, fine uh, suspended particles and um, the organic material that's going to be around from both creek beds that are cracked and the drying vegetation and other silt um, from a, a wetting and a drying and a wetting and a drying event. 
conductivity also significantly increased. It only looks small there, um, but that that then starts to change, um, a pr can change other things to do with chemical reactions that are happening within the stream. Temperature wasn't so notable, a little bit higher in mind and versus non-mind, um, more so in the spring. So you would expect even a higher jump there in the summer. And Uh, this was part of the method that ANSTO did to change the uh, standard for determining trace metal concentrations and that was a piece they did to get the incredibly low detection limits and they just changed it by the way they spiked a standard into the test. So I don't need to go into that. Uh, but coming to the trace metals, out of the four trace metals that were selected, uh, lithium was by far uh, the winner in terms of the quality results out of the laboratory and um, meaningfully showing a difference between mined and non-mined. The chromium results were almost nonsense. They didn't at all um, pick up a correct analysis for the standard injected in, so we would consider that a failed test. And molybdenum and beryllium were a little bit all over the shop. Uh, but lithium had uh, quite strong results which were then able to be used to run a statistical analysis and we found a difference. So higher in the winter and definitely more variable and um, what you would consider, you call, we call those lines the wobble lines and it certainly got a lot wobblier in spring. So potentially showing that this could be used in streams where you may not be physically seeing the cracks or um, have a visual um, clue that mining impact is happening, a shift wet where you've got quite stable and, and what you would consider known baseline levels, a shift out of that into these other um, higher concentrations could be an indication that you've got mining happening, but you just can't see where the impact is. Um, so we've had uh, of the water quality that went through the laboratories, the two strongest um, significant difference were in the bicarbonate and the um, barium. So quite a big shift, um, a big significant difference there between the mined and the non-mined um, and between seasons. So here non-mined and here you're, you're it's increased, you've more than doubled, you've actually three or four times your um, bicarbonate iron activity in this chemistry and much more variable results. Barium, nice movement out of what would have been considered a baseline concentration and now jumping up a little bit. So further work on that would be great to do. They don't tend to be included in monitoring programs because they're expensive to um, analyse. These are the three others that showed strong significant difference. Uh, first up we have sodium. Um, Ian Wright's gone on to publish a piece on sodium across drinking water catchments in, across Australia because uh, these wouldn't tend to be looked at if you had a typical drinking water quality monitoring program. Um, so just the fact that you've started to get an increase here, it's taking you out of what would be the baseline for these creeks in, in what, what is non-mined, much more stable, to what is starting to increase in mind. Um, and so he's done a publication in 2019 on increasing sodium uh, concentrations in mining impacted drinking water catchments, and he's highly recommended that sodium be added to the monitoring programs. Um, iron, iron appears, we, we start seeing the release of um, iron ions out of the rock, they oxidise with the um, presence of oxygen and then they start to, you've probably seen it if you've walked on any of the streams down there that are mining impacted big, um, bacteria mats and um, bacteria produce, uh, iron fixing bacteria mats that start to really show on the surface, bright orange. They can be naturally high 
in some of the upper headwater swamps and the headwater swamps can sometimes have a pH of four and a half. Um, the pH down in these areas, further downstream in the running creeks will be in your six to seven range. But up in the headwater swamps, you can get some naturally occurring um, iron precipitate and, and that, that will exist in that zone that is of quite a low, what's considered peat acidic um, headwaters. But that tends to dissipate by the time you get further downstream. So the reappearance of it in the larger creeks downstream um, is as a result of that mining activity. Chloride ions also showed a significant difference. Um, so that was included there. Um, this is a bit of a fancy st multivariate statistical analysis called a principal component analysis. And what, oh, it's actually been a little bit corrupted somewhere in among, oh, it's actually flipped itself <laughs> upside down. Um, I'll make sure that is fixed before this copy comes to you. But essentially what it's showing is you've got a clear separation, regardless of the fact that the legend is flipped and the um, um, transects are showing backwards. It's showing a separation of your mind to your non-mind sites. And as a result of the presence of bicarbonates, it's picking up all of those water chemistry variables that had a significant difference um, between mind and non-mind and it's showing you a bigger concentration of sodium chloride bicarbonate temperature magnesium conductivity over here is why is separating away from these non-mind sites which would have lower concentrations so um so that that's a, a great visual representation of that sorry if it's a little bit beyond um, a non-statistician. I'm not a statistician myself, so I tend to use the skills of those statisticians around me. So moving on to the macroinvertebrates, this is um, a part of the project that I enjoyed the most as being an aquatic ecologist, specifically a taxonomist. Um, looking at the edge results, if, you, if, if um, any of you um, need a bit of an explanation on what the macroinvertebrates are. They are invertebrates that are roughly two millimetres or higher or, or larger that live in the aquatic zone, under rocks, amongst the leaf litter, in the edges, in the riffles. And they generally have a nymph or a larval stage in the water and a big proportion of them then either fly away as adults or emerge as adults and have part of their life stage out of the water. There are lots of orders that stay in the water for their whole lifestyle. Um, a lot of beetles, a lot of um, bugs, Um So you get quite a mix. They're very varied and they cover the worms, the shells, the mayflies, the stoneflies, the caddisflies. Um, so this study, by aiming at each of those little um, sample zones to get everything that was in that zone, it was aiming to get a quantitative community assemblage and then use those to compare between mind and non-mind. So as to be expected, there was a little bit less difference um, in the edge results between mind and non-mind than the riffles, but we're just looking at the edges first. So this blue line here and this green line show by far the most dominant taxa with the diptera and they're the true flies. So they're an awesome little group and there's a few um, national taxonomists in Australia that focus just on these groups. Sydney Water houses a species um, voucher collection for all of these animals. We've got about 1400 species in that collection, just a bit over that at the moment. Um, there's a lot of molecular work going on to barcode the animals so that we're maintaining quite an extensive library of that. That's the, um, that's the future work so that people aren't having to look down a microscope to ID them. What is um, notable here is that this little first group, the trichoptera, which are the caddisflies, there's definitely a higher proportion of them in the non-mind than the mind sites. Not a lot of difference within the other orders. So we started to look a little bit more at particularly the trichoptera order, what was happening between the mind and the non-mind sites. 
but we certainly picked up that in these graphs over here, it was considered no significant difference between the um, number of genus found at see these wobble bars are quite high across both mind and non mind. They tend to sit within each other, and the statistical test has shown no significant difference. But you would expect that ponds have a, have a unique fauna that are uh, suited to living in the ponded, slow flowing edge habitats. Mining impact, which is slowing the flow down, is going to less impact on those taxa that live in those edges. But in saying that, I did do a bit of a deep dive into what is considered, um, this acronym is called the EPT taxa. That's your Ephemoptera, your Plecoptera, and your Tricoptera taxa. And they're your three most sensitive orders of taxa. So in terms of sensitivity, they're the ones that are most likely going to disappear when there's an impact because of the way their morphology is designed. They all have gills, so they all do an oxygen exchange um, over those gills. And any siltation, change in chemistry, um, impacts the way those gills do oxygen exchange and they'll be the first ones targeted to be removed if there is an impact. And they're the ones that you're highly unlikely to find in a highly urbanised or a highly impacted creek. Um, so again here, it had found now by looking just at that group within the, the whole assemblage, we're now looking at, we've got a significant difference between the EPT genera for mined and not mined sites. So here you can see we're, we're getting six or seven, we're down to two or three in the mined. A little bit less difference in the spring. Um, and this is for total number of genus. This one is total number of individuals. We didn't see too much in that space because where you might lose a sensitive animal, you'll tend to get more of another type. So a little bit of a less useful indicator there. If we zoom just in on the trichoptera, which are your caddis flies, you can see we have 12 less at the mined sites and a really, that, that's showing that there's quite a significant difference between the mined and the non-mined sites. So again, I've maintained the blue and the green, the green being for the mined sites, the blue being for non-mined sites. We have the presence of a lot of these tricapture caddis flies at mined sites that do not appear at all in the, uh, sorry, at the non-mined sites that do not appear at the mined sites. So that was interesting. And I thought, right, if that happened in the edges, what's it like in the riffles? Um, the trichopter, I think I've got some pictures of them a bit further along. I can show you what they look like. Oh, here we go. They're right here. So um, what I've taken here for this page, if anyone's interested further in looking at trichopter, on the right hand side is a link to the Murray Darling Freshwater Research Centre. It's called Mudfrick, and they have developed a comprehensive web-based identification tool um, where, you know, you can do some of it with the naked eye, but the, to get down to genus and, um, and often family level, you'll need a microscope. But if anyone's interested, they're public available tools. On the left is an exciting little advertisement for a, um, I think he was a Texan scientist, put all these caddis flies into an environment where they could actually pick gemstones out while they were making their cases. So I've just put in that, that in there because it's beautiful and to just give you a link to um, why the caddis flies are called caddis flies. They're called caddis flies because they build these lovely little cases and they use the, the um, sand and the sediment on the base of the creek to build their little stone houses. So they're a lovely group and an important functional group. They, they're shredders, um, I mean they shred leaf matter, um, as a functional feeding group. They actually cover quite a number of the feeding groups, but an interesting group to see drastically reduced at the mined sites. Uh, that's really quite crazy. That's another upside down multivariate statistical analysis. I'll just, whoops, skip that one. Um, and now we're moving on to the riffles. And I've just got very similar three slides to the last three slides I had. So 
what you're seeing now is we do have a significant difference between the non the mind, non mind and the mind creek. So we do have a significant um, decrease of the number of taxa that are being found in the mind creeks versus the non mind creeks. Again, diptera were the most the true flies were the most dominant taxa in that um, in those community assemblages those samples. EPT, so looking at the trichoptera, the plecoptera, and the ephemoptera, so the E, the P, and the T, again, we're seeing an increase in the ephemoptera, and that was in a group specifically called the baited, so a bit less sensitive, but again, you've got this big reduction in trichopterans at the mind to the non mind sites. So when we come in, um, I'll just go past that and come straight down to here. Here is, um, that's a photo from under the microscope of a little caddis fly out of his case. You use both the case and the little gills on the tail end of this fellow to identify him. And now we've got 16 less genus of the caddis flies um, at the mind compared to the non-mind sites. So that was probably the most um, interesting piece out of this study and starting to see that there was, was a shift, even though you know, it might appear on the surface that there's just a bit of a physical difference and there hadn't been any major water quality impacts. Um, you, you are starting to pick up now a change in that fauna if you've got the right program to sample to detect that. I do apologize this is another upside down graph. Um, it's hard to talk through these while all of the numbers um, are turned around but basically this is a st statistical tool that places the community assemblage data so all of the macroinvertebrate data and all the counts for each of the taxa within a big um, regression uh, in a big um, data set and it's starting to look for patterns of separation and so what we started to see here was you could start to draw a line mildly between a non-mind and a mind catchment it's starting to get a clearer separation uh, these boxes and things can be turned in all sorts of directions so i think they've done a bit of a twist since i placed them in there but apologies for that but that's they're they're about um they're called multi-dimensional scaling and they are a multivariate statistical tool used to present your data visually. I'll skip over the signal. Signal um, is called Signal Sydney Genus and it's an indice that Bruce Chessman um, has developed for the use of uh, macroinvertebrate sampling and monitoring in organic enriched areas which would include sewage treatment plants specifically um, urban areas and agriculture so I was just doing a little test to see if it was useful here but it served uh, no purpose and it um, and and rightfully so because you're not looking at organically enriched sites um, the diatoms, we're approaching the end of the talk, but the diatoms um, definitely significantly differed between sites. We had, uh, what we ended up finding was more, i just get my little, what we ended up finding was much greater abundance of diatoms at non-mined sites. Now, well, I've had to log these scales because the, the, net, the counts that were in the genera for um, the non-mined samples couldn't be graphed uh, without a log scale. So by logging the data, I was able to physically fit it on the page. But it's further emphasising that there is a big difference between mined and non-mined sites. And what I've just done is picked out the two uh, most common groups there to further reduce the data set and keep it simple for a visual. Still running some statistics on that and there's been a new um, a new test that I should be able to apply to that that um, one of the scientists ran me through a couple of days ago so it should be um, should be ready soon and I'll try and make sure I put that in the PDF. So I think um, just representing that where you have 
um, water, a maintenance of a water layer above the rocks where the diatoms were collected, it maintains high diversity and high numbers. Where you impact that and now potentially have rocks that are sitting in a stream being exposed to dryness for periods of time and then being covered, you're starting for it to reduce the genera on those rocks and the total numbers on them. Diatoms, uh, scrapers um, of which caddisflies are a major scraper. They're a scavenger and a scraper and a shredder. And the scavengers, uh, the scrapers would scrape diatoms off the rocks as a food source. So you've started to impact that food source, which is why you would start to see an impact in the um, macroinvertebrates. Oh, that's not looking good at all. It's actually missing bits, so apologies for that. But um, if I just run you through, I think these were the mined and these were the non-mined diatoms. And that stress level that's on this non-multidimensional scale uh, almost means you could draw a line through the mined and non-mined and it sh that numerically it represented a strong data set. So that was quite a valuable piece. Diatoms are actually only done in one of the seasons. I couldn't afford to do them in both the spring and the winter. Um, it cost about $5,000 just to get those ID'd. So I would have loved to have done more with those, um, but hopefully it's led to some further investigations. So basically we came to um, a few conclusions and, and points that were discussed for the research. So the mined rivers, they do continue to flow following rainfall, but it's, this would show that they're losing water at a faster rate which is then causing ponding, which would cause habitat segregation. So you're, you're favouring your pool, fauna and taxa. Um, the lithium has been identified as being a good indicator of groundwater to surface water um, interface. Uh, the riffles show the stronger um, statistical differences between macroinvertebrates on the non-mined and mined sites. Uh, but when we took the water quality data as a whole and overlaid it with mac all the macroinvertebrate data, there wasn't any one particular strong um, analyte that correlated to the response in the macroinvertebrates. So um, I had, didn't include any slides on that here, but those statistical tests all came out as poor. So it's, it's the cumulative impact of the whole lot rather than it being attributed to one particular bicarbonate or trace metal or... Um, physical parameter. It's a collection of all of them. Um, and the diatoms differed. So limitations, um, definitely the, the restricted access into the catchments may meant seeking approval to not only get the overall access but for each sampling event uh, meant I was really limited and you know it serves the purpose of protecting the catchment but it also keeps um, valuable scientists away and and I think that that restricted access poses further problems still today um, where it is so tight it means you, you're not able to do any overnight trips so where you would like to get your data much faster and potentially staying in the catchment overnight to pick up the next morning you might have a week in between sampling events while you um, travel in between to get all of your um, data and a limitation with this particular study is all of the data gaps with the data loggers that we just had to deal with. So the future direction um, was to get better water level data. Uh, the mining companies have a lot of money and it should have been a requirement on them to have the data logger information set by um, the regulator or, or by the water body managers at particular places and then that data should be publicly available. Um, Water New South Wales do not know if they get quality data from the mining companies and they are always questioning the data and there's no transparency around the way it is collected or stored um, and so it is a weakness. Water New South Wales have many uh, redu much reduced um, data level loggers and they tend to place them down in the catchments close to the water storages so that they're maintaining um, 
flow data for that dam. It's much harder to pick up changes at that point downstream as to all the changes that would be much greater if you had your flow data also up in your headwater streams. Uh, better timed water quality and ecology sampling. So basically, Water New South Wales have a macroinvertebrate monitoring program. They only sample once a year for that. They sample every summer. Um, uh, so just collecting samples once a year are going to um, really restrict what you can do with that data to show changes. It's still good, um, but they certainly also had some issues in their overall macroinvertebrate monitoring program with limited number of replicates and a rotating site timetable or schedule frequency. So some sites weren't being done um, yearly. They were actually being done once every five years. So due to budget cuts, um, rather than collecting everything, you'd have to make some decisions around what you're going to chop. And rather than chopping all sites, uh, some, uh, some sites and leaving a few that you did really well, they tried to maintain um, doing lots of sites, which was, I was able to present um, a bit of work to them at one stage to get them to look at that. And I think they have um, implemented some changes there. Um, there was a, a note here to expect water quality. Yep, that's right. Further investigate the role of upstream non-mined areas. So where you have some upstream non-mined areas with significant macroinvertebrate fauna, you could look to have those tagged as um, what you would consider refuge areas um, and further protect them from mining impacts so that then those sites can be the provider of taxa to further downstream areas um, it's just it's just a concept that's coming up when we attend the Australian Society of Limnology conferences each year they're identifying it on the Murray Darling they're identifying it up in the Northern Territory Western Australia um, where you have major river systems so you know are now impacted beyond um, repair how do you identify the most valuable parts of that river system to look after and preserve and it's not at the loss of other areas, but just so that you can focus all your energy on maintaining preservation of those areas, um, if all else fails. Um, there are some further studies that have looked at, whoops, isotopic radium. Um, that was uh, the isotope in particular. It, it can be a um, tool to help you identify the source of the radium and different isotopic um, signatures can help you work out for your water in the creek, whether it has come from further upstream or from a groundwater source. So there's been a fair bit published in that space. So I think we know that is a successful tool now. Um, and then interestingly, the use of satellite imagery to measure subsidence, um, that the technology in that space that's used for all sorts of other purposes is actually fairly accurate. You can get down to the, um, you know, the centimetres, if not millimetres, um, and that would be a very good tool to be using in this catchment or any catchment impacted by long wall coal mining. Um, so there's some further references there. I've got some more to add to that. Uh, the last little bit is a bit that I presented to Water New South Wales to question or to help them look at why their monitoring programs weren't picking up um, impacts. It's all been a little bit corrupted there, so I'm just going to skip over it. Um, so that was just a small um, piece of work I did with them, looking at why possibly they weren't picking up the impacts that the, in their either their macroinvertebrate monitoring program or in the reports that the mining companies submit to them um, at the beginning and end of a long wall panel. And we're up to questions. Well, I don't think we've been thrown off the meeting yet, unless there's no one listening and I'm talking to myself. I, I'm still <laughs> and there's here. a photo yeah. of my parents. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> thanks, Kim. Lovely. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, uh, Kat. It's, it's uh, extremely interesting and, and uh, detailed. The technology uh, and the techniques take a long time to uh, uh, generate results, don't they? It's a lot of hard work to get in there. Um, anyway, are there yeah. people um, out there who would like to ask questions? Um, I've indicated that you could send me a, a, a chat um, message. 
nobody's come in yet at this stage. If you have a question, um, just say, I have a question and I'll call on you. Yes, it's a big ask for the first Zoom meeting to it work is. out how to use a chat line as well. <laughs> it is a bit, yeah. A few of us have been practicing. Um, yeah. In the meantime, um, our uh, Streamwatch group and our, um, our River Health Monitoring groups, um, uh, we've been into collecting the macroinvertebrates and um, determining the river health of um, the couple of creeks around our area. Um, it moved from um, uh, Sydney Water, the Streamwatch um, area, moved yes. from Sydney Water to the Australian Museum. Uh, and they had a big focus on um, uh, doing the, the bug counts, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so do you have um, any connections with, um, do research with the Australian Museum uh, in this field? Would, would look, um, was it a Cecil Ellis that you've been dealing with? Yes, yeah, he was from, yeah. yeah. Sydney Water. Yeah, and look, I know Cecil. Australia, yeah. yeah, look, Sydney Water um, had two uh, two sections when we were first building our macroinvertebrate um, voucher catalogue. We were taking it to species level, so that's going to require, like on the screen, I've got a, a stereo microscope there. But for many of the body parts on the animals. Um, to get to species, you need to take them off, put them on a slide and then put them under a slide microscope. And it wasn't long after we started building that collection in about 1990 uh, that we decided to get NADA accreditation for it. So we got NADA accreditation for our macroinvertebrate collection and the sampling and the identification and reporting of that data in about 1998. So what happened was Streamwatch had a focus on community and education programs. I think they started in schools, uh, particularly um, primary schools, I think, to, to have a package for um, education on what, what did stream water quality mean and, and what were these things that were called bugs. So it then expanded to have high schools and community groups in that as well. Um, the popularity of that was so enormous at one stage, we had to put a hold on adding any further um, members to that because the staff were struggling to meet all the needs of the schools and the community groups. Uh, but a separate database was built for that data because it's coming with um, a, a quality code on it that we would consider fairly broad, where someone could categorise an animal at an order or a family level and then the, our database would accept that data. So it's a great way to build data. And in fact, South Australia bases some of the monitoring for their big um, stream river projects on community data. They call it citizen science and it's not mm. done by the organisation or by professionals at all. So it does, certainly holds value. Um, but there was sort of two separate arms in Sydney Water. I've always known the Streamwatch team and we've supported them with the development of their tools. We've provided bugs for their training material, um, but we're essentially running more a, um, a production monitoring and at times a research lab out of the aquatic ecology lab. And then several years ago, it went to the museum. And I think Sydney Water's committed to supporting it for four or five years. And, and then I am not sure where the funding is going to come from. Hopefully okay. through the museum or the government. Mm. Thanks, um, uh, Kath. Um, next question could come from uh, Sue and Peter Debusable. If you unmute your mic, you can ask your question of Catherine. Um, Catherine, can you feel confident that some of these um, uh, loggers, I think you called them, that were set up in the streams, yeah. were not deliberately damaged? What? Hello? Um, I definitely had Peabody ring me at one stage to indicate that they had removed one of my data loggers. Um, they used, they tried to use the excuse that my very small 10 centimetre Dynabolt had caused a big crack in a stream 
and that for that reason they had to remove it. Um, I challenged them to say the techniques used to drill a hole and align a star picket with a dynabolt into the rock couldn't have caused a crack in the stream bed. Um, but they followed through and I actually got fined. Um, Peabody made two complaints. Uh, one was of my um, presentation of the study design before I even had any results at a conference in New Zealand to all my freshwater science peers. Uh, I presented the study design and Peabody complained um, to Water New South Wales and Water New South Wales sent me a fine of about $900 for that one and then $900 for this uh, placement of the data logger. So they were absolutely insane. I didn't have $1,800 to pay in fines and I didn't want on my record that I'd done something wrong. So I fought both of them. I had both of the fines reversed and I had Peabody apologise for removing a data logger. They gave it back, uh, but I was already months into the study by then. And that data logger caused me, it, it actually didn't physically work. When they dry out, the membranes can get sensitive and it just sat on the bank for so long where they'd thrown it in the bush that it actually didn't work anymore. Each of them is worth $500. They were provided by the university. So, yeah, I, it just, it, it got annoying having to deal with these things. I did fight both, um, what Water New South Wales did was try and turn the two fines into just a warning. But again, I fought those because I didn't want warnings against my name. And I thought fundamentally, they were just pandering to the mining company. So I think one of them ended up being reversed and the other one stood. And Water New South Wales said at the time, we need to look like we're doing something. They were their exact words. So that was very frustrating. But I got rung at work late one night, about nine o'clock by Peabody saying, who are you? What are you doing? And how dare you um, be in our study area? So I was just very nice to them and told them I had every right to be in there because I had all the approvals. Thanks, Catherine. Um, there's a question from Jim V. Uh, is the lithium due to water going into a crack and then surfacing lower down the creek? Well, not sure. The study design could be both. Uh, the study design has picked up that it, it's there and it increases when the, the rock cracks appear. Um, so further study of both the groundwater as a source and experiments around water travelling over sandstone. Um, it's really hard to answer that question with the way I've collected data and, and the very reduced time sets around that. Um, yeah, it's if, if there's any hydrogeochemists around uh, in the audience, I'd certainly be happy if anyone knows of a paper where that might be the case because it, it has been one of the gaps in this study and it's difficult to answer. Um, so I more look at it, it shows a difference and it leaves it open for further work. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sharon. Uh, do you want to ask your Sorry. question? Yes, my question was about the elevated levels of both lithium and um, barium, I think. And I just yep. wondered what they might mean in terms of toxicity for macroinvertebrates, because I think some metals can be quite toxic, can't they? Absolutely. The, the levels that they're um, increasing to are still what you would consider extremely <coughs> low. Um, okay. But part of the um, process of handing over this data to Water New South Wales and having them review it, they did perform a test of taking the concentrations in these areas and doing a loading in the reservoir based on what might then make it to a water filtration plant, which may end up costing Sydney Water money to remove those elements. Um, but each time they've done... So, so when they're assessing... Um, increasing concentrations that's what they're looking for an impact to a water filtration plant that might impact um, the amount of water they can put through filtration to send to customers so in terms of um, the levels of toxicity to aquatic life that's still considered um, fairly low and you wouldn't be getting anywhere near what um, might be considered a, a ANZAC guideline um, trigger limit for protection of aquatic life. You're still well below those sort of um, levels. But 
at the trace levels that have increased, it potentially could be. Um, good okay. question. Uh, from uh, Matt, Matt Allison, did DPI take into account these findings when permission was granted for mining in Warrenora catchment? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Sure. Did DPI take into account these findings when permission was granted for mining in the Warrenora catchment? Oh, look, that's a good question. After this study um, was submitted to the university and submitted to Water New South Wales, Water New South Wales did not want to um, acknowledge receipt of the data or, um, or meet. So it took me 12 months to be able to just get them to sit at the table to um, get the results and help, help them understand them. So once I was able to do that, they were much more open to um, seeing that I didn't have a vested interest, you know, running straight to the front of uh, Sydney Morning Herald. I, I just wanted to, the good data to base um, further decision making on good data and the further collection of good data. Um, so what I got invited to after that was they started developing a new framework for the mining approval process. So it was an incredibly complicated process of taking what are this, um, the um, agreed impacts or um, monitoring that is going to look for impacts, how do they expand on that and set a new framework for whether something is impacted or not. You had a fairly coarse uh, a fairly broad approval process before then, which really had um, one question, is there an impact on the quantity or quality of water? And it was just too broad. It had to come back to go within each of those, what is gonna be the framework for whether something is, in, is approved? And then if it's approved of whether they're considered a minimal, um, a zero impact, minimal impact, moderate or, or great. So I, worked with Sydney Water to review that and we put a submission back to Water New South Wales to say this is getting close, this is getting close to being a better framework but we still think it needs lots of improvements. Sydney Water would like to work with Water New South Wales to help you with that and, and I had a team of scientists who helped in the um, submission back to Water New South Wales. I haven't heard anything since we made that first submission um, I, I, I do have the, the network and communication channels that I can chase that up. Um, but I do believe I, I did go onto the website for the latest release and I did have a bit of a look to see where they're at. And the, late, the last letter of response for this mining application is that they haven't submitted an extensive enough um, review of what they're proposing to do in accordance to this new framework and they need to provide that data. So according to my perception of where this current approval is at, the mining company are still being asked to provide some data. If they can't do that, then I presume the framework is now set to somewhat restrict their ability to just go and do it anyway, which in the past um, tended to happen. So. I, I'm still apologise that I didn't go into further make inquiries about where that's at. I'm not even sure if there's a um, submission, uh, uh, whether it's still open for further submissions to respond um, with suitable, um, you know, questioning of that. But to me, to, so the framework has somewhat got some rigour to it now where the, that they've, detailed what is considered the impacts and, a, and, and damaging um, bedrock within streams is considered an impact that they don't consider acceptable. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we might have to make this one the last question. Um, it's from Gary Housley. What is known about the genomics of indicator species? Has DNA analysis with drone-based water sampling been considered for cost-effective quantitative periodic population sampling? Um, oh, I love it. That's a great <laughs> question. 
I, I can answer two things there. Um, Sydney Water did start to look at drones for the use of um, water quality sampling. Um, that was at the same time the government had to start cracking down on the um, license process and who was going to be approved to operate drones. I think it started to escalate quite quickly and there was all sorts of um, risks associated with that. So we've got several staff that are going through the pilot training, um, pilot license. Um, application process at the moment so they will be uh, able to fly the drones. The drones of a particular size performing a particular task um, that meant they needed to be operated by professionals. So we're getting a step closer to drones being able to do routine testing for us. In terms of cost, it's actually exactly the same cost at the moment for to deploy a drone to collect a water sample as it is to put a few people on a boat um, if it's offshore. These are the examples we've been using off um, 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 one of the deep ocean outfalls for Sydney, Diamond Bay, where we have a shore discharge, not a deep ocean outfall. Um, so at the moment, costs on par. In terms of molecular work, um, we've got couple of projects happening internally for Sydney Water at the moment looking at freshwater systems and we did a environmental DNA from the water sample and it actually had a lot of quality issues with that data so it actually served to lead the research in a direction of still collecting a, a sample that had bugs in it but then putting them in a bit of a blender and sending that off for um, the molecular, molecular work to be done. So we're getting there. Um, marine samples and estuarine samples are much further progressed in the environmental DNA space. And we're using um, diatoms from eDNA samples in the estuarine space and some sediment samples. Um, so we're getting there. It'll take a few more years before we're at that stage, but I like the sound of just flying a drone in and picking up a sample. <laughs> Great. Uh, that's terrific. Thank you, Kath. Um, I'd like to now call on um, Adrian Polhill to um, move a vote of thanks. Okay, thanks, Kim. I can, okay, Kim, you can hear me? Not very well. Oh, can okay. You speak up? Okay. Uh, is that better? Yep. Okay, yeah. uh, Kathy, thank you so much uh, for a very thoughtful, very knowledgeable presentation. I think um, you've helped raise a lot of uh, additional questions which uh, haven't been able to be answered tonight, but um, we really enjoyed your, your very, very interesting presentation. I'd like to give a very special welcome to your mum and dad. Uh, because um, I know they're online still, and uh, uh, it's we do just a, a little bit of a hello to Mr. and Mrs. Cantwell because we do get your newsletter from the Blue Mountains Conservation Society. Uh, so thanks for that, uh, and, uh, and and we're glad you could join the presentation by Kathy. Um, but from all of us, from all our members, Kathy, um, we've had a really interesting talk. If we do have one or two further questions, um, um, is it okay that uh, we can pose those to you at some stage during the, the, the next uh, few days? Is that okay with you, Kathy? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay. I could see a couple more come up on the chat, but I don't have my feed. Um, am I able <laughs> to access the ones that would already be placed in the chat? Uh, you can, yes. I think you, After yeah, the yeah, meeting okay. is closed? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, that'll be that'll be super. Thank you. All right. No um, so uh, I think that's um yeah. So uh, and it's given us some uh, all of us some really interesting th food for thought as we ponder our next steps um, uh, mm. to consider how we can uh, who we can approach and how we can approach it in terms of uh, getting this um, long wall mining uh, stopped, at, uh, particularly at Warrenora uh, Dam. So um, thanks again, Kathy. It's been very, very good to have you on board. Thank you very, very much. Pleasure. Thank you, Thank you so much for letting yeah. me, uh, for reigniting my passion for this piece of study and making sure I get it published. Yeah, That's okay. my next day. <laughs> yeah, thank yeah. you. All right, over to you, Kim. Thanks, Kath. We'll follow your, uh, your f future work uh, with much interest. Um, oh, thank you. I'll just mute now and then just hang on for the rest of your meeting. Okay, that's fine. That's good.